I want to share with you something about uh, the, the Bible. I never preach in English, so I don't know if, you, if you're going to understand me. If you don't understand my accent, ask to the Holy Spirit for interpretation. Because <laughs> I don't, I never, Pat, Patsy told me, are you going to preach, but you preach in English. I don't know. I, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to try. Uh, <clears throat> I have to, I'm like Sofia Vergara. <laughs> she said, she said, I have to think every word. You don't know what is to think every word first in Spanish and then in, 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 in uh, English. You get tired. <laughs> I went, some time ago, I went to Africa and uh, to a church, and the pastor told me, you have to preach. I say I never preach, and not to African guys. Well, I live in Texas. We have different accents. So probably you, can, you guys can understand me. And he put me to preach. So I was preaching the first day. And I said, if you don't like it the first day, that's okay. I'm not going to do it the second day. Then the second day he said, you're going to preach again. <laughs> and I said, man, I don't have too much vocabulary. <laughs> and then the third day, the fourth day, the f at, by the sixth day, I said, listen, I don't have any more words. You guys know all my words right now. <laughs> so and I can I I I really tired because I, I've been thinking from Spanish to English to African English, which is word, worst. They they said instead of saying God, they say God. God. God? That's why you are like you are. God never listens to you, man. God. <laughs> anyway. I want to I wanna go to a verse in the Bible that uh, it's very well known. Patty mentioned something about this verse in the Bible. Matthew 14, 28, it says, Then Peter answered, answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the waters. You know, the first time that I went to Israel, we, we've been doing trips to Israel since 19... 97. And at that time, the first time that I went to Israel, I grew up in a very legalistic congregation. They were very legalistic. So I thought I knew the Bible because I knew how to judge everyone. <laughs> yeah, you think you know the Bible because you know how to throw stones to other people. That's Christianity today. You just open Facebook and everybody and everyone is throwing, judging everybody, but not them. <laughs> and and I, I thought I knew the Bible and the, the tour guide started to explaining, explaining me all the things about that we were looking in every place that we were visiting. And I said, this guy, he doesn't know the Bible. Why, why, why are we doing this tour? So I start to explain to him. And he, he said, listen, you're a Mexican and you're trying to explain me the Bible. I'm a Jewish guy. I was born here. And I, I realized it's like a gringo trying to explain me the life of Pancho Villa. <laughs> or guacamole. <laughs> or tacos. A, 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 a gringo doesn't know anything about Pancho Villa or, 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 or guacamole or tacos. Just look at the. I have some fr gringo friends who said, they said, hey, let's go to the Mexican restaurant, Taco Bell. That's not a Mexican restaurant, dude. <laughs> you should come to my house. My, that's the real food, Mexican food. <laughs> yeah, my wife is here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> No, she, I always forgot to introduce my wife. <laughs> uh, Ruth is here with me. Well, you already met Ruth. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, Pancho Villa. <laughs> then I realized, and the guy told me, the tour guy told me, you always, you guys, you Latins, 
are always looking through the Bible through your culture, through your lens. And it's weird, but even people think, some people think that Jesus is an American invention. Yeah. The other day I was in a church and a guy came to me and he said, is it true that Jesus was a Jewish guy? I was like, really, dude? What book are you reading? And, and I realized that most of the knowledge that we have about the Bible, it, it, it comes, uh, we lo we're looking some of those verses through the lens of our culture. So the historical background is very impor important. Uh, the guy told me, you Latins are very different than that us, that Jewish people. And I know that we are really different. For instance, we are a culture of a matriarchal culture, right? Very, uh, how many houses your mom is the boss? <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. And uh, uh, most of us, we live, uh, I don't know if here in Latin, uh, I know that there are Latins who are born here in the United States. So I don't know, but in Latin America, some people live, are living in the, in, the, in the house of their parents until they are 40. Our culture is very manipula manipulative culture. Historically, we are not conquerors. Uh, sometimes we start something what, that we never finish. Latinos, are, we are like that. We leave everything for tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll do it. Is it true or not? Latinos, we have a, an excuse for everything. When you were a kid at the school that you failed in your homework, what was the excuse? Oh, my teacher doesn't know how to write in the, on the chalkboard. That's why I, don't, I didn't do my homework. We have excuse for everything, and that excuse extends into our life as adults. If we don't go to, to our work, it's because of the pandemic. Uh, the other day, uh, they asked me, why you have that hair so long? The pandemic. I stopped going to the barber shop, and then I stopped. <laughs> so I had to go back. <laughs> this morning I was looking at my hair and I said, man, you're ugly, man. <laughs> that hair is ugly. <laughs> but we have excuses for everything. Uh, then when you go, go back to the story, you're, you're going to understand the story a little bit better when you know a little bit about the background of the story. Uh, Peter said... Jesus, if it is you, command me to come to you on the waters. Jesus was walking on the waters in the middle of a storm. And I don't know if you have to think about that, but what kind of question is that? Who is going to ask Jesus on why he's going to ask Jesus to uh, come to walk in the water in the middle of a storm. How many of you have been in, a, in the middle of a storm? Most of us, we not have been, even been in a ship, <laughs> less in a storm. <laughs> uh, but when I was thinking about this question, I said, why, why this guy ask Jesus to do that? Uh, we all know that Peter was a big mouth guy, Right? You don't have a big mouth guy here in the church? You don't have a Peter at church? Oh, man. You should have one. <laughs> Those guys are very interesting. But Peter, that, that he always had a big mouth. He spoke, hey, let me come to you on the water. But when you understand why he asked to Jesus that, when you understand the background, then you understand why he asked that question. The, the story makes more sense if you know the background. We are conditioned to think of according to our culture. What, what is the background of that story? Okay, Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He had a Jewish education. 
He was living in a Jewish world. He was not an American, not a Mexican, not a European, not a Chinese, thanks God. <laughs> the image that we have of Jesus is shaped according to our culture. When you think about Jesus, what do you think? The first thing that you, that you think about Jesus. Always that I think about Jesus, I think about a, a hippie, happy hippie. Long hair, that, that look, to, uh, you know, look into heaven like, Father, I'm here. <laughs> we have that image because that, that is the image that uh, religion sometimes gave us or the culture, right? So, but the kind of Jesus that the Bible is talking about, it was a different person. Where did Jesus grow up? He grew up in a mon monotheistic system. A monotheistic, monotheistic say it says, it's pronounced like that, monotheistic system? Uh, monotheismo. Yeah, is right? Monotheistic. Where life revolved about, around the five first books of the Bible, uh, the, which is called the Torah. Torah means the teaching or the instructions. Remember what the Deuteronomy says, and these words that I'm commanding you today shall be upon your heart, and you shall repeat them to your children, and you shall speak of them when you are at home, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you get up. That, that is the system in which Jewish people live. They we're teaching always the, the words of the Torah. And the Judaic, the Judaic teaching system, it was done in a synagogue under a teacher or rabbi. They had these uh, people who, who, who were called the rabbis, close to what we have today, which is pastors. In Christianity, it's pastors. They had these teachers that are called rabbis. So this system, this educational system that they had, had three levels. Indeed, Jewish people is responsible, according to history, to history for um, having the, one of the first educational systems in the world. When you read the, the Bible in Genesis, the, the Bible says that uh, all the air was corrupted and living in violence. They were not educated people. They were savages. Savages? Savage? people. So the, the Israelites had this, they have developed this system, teaching system, and uh, they had three levels. And the first level was called Bates Affair. So kids from five to ten years old attended this level, five to ten years old. And what they did in this, in this uh, system, in this uh, first level, the, 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 the best of the society, in a Jewish society, they went to this level and they memorized, they were trying to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Well, they, they didn't have books, they had scrolls at that time. So in the end, uh, they trying to memorize that by the 10 years, when they were 10 years old, they knew most of the uh, five books on the Bible. And I have a friend who is a Jewish guy, and he told me one time, when I was eight years old, I already have read like 200 books. I have or not? <laughs> I don't know how many books have you read in your life, but me, I hardly, <laughs> I don't know how many, but not 200. At eight, I don't know what I was doing. Right, but I was not reading 200. So, uh, by the, when they were 10 years old, they were doing the second level, which is, is called Beit Talmud. And at this level, only the best of the best continued to study at this level. So, young people from 10 to 15 years old attended this level. Then, after that, only the best of the best of the best attended the third level. 
And only the best of the best of the best were young adults from 16 that they were supposed to study the Torah in a, in a more deep way. They were supposed to become rabbis, teachers of the, of the word of God. So and this third, third level was very important because only people who were the best of the best of the best were allowed to study at this level. They knew if you were studying at Beit Midrash, you were, you were going to be a rabbi. You were going to be one of the most respected persons in Israel. You were going to be uh, a teacher of the word of, of God. And, and uh, so what happened in this third level? What happened with the people that didn't make it to the third level? They went back and they were involved in the, father, in the family business. They were doing a, a different things, right? But in the third level, they were looking at people who were the best of the best of the best. They were looking for a rabbi and they uh, requested to this rabbi to be uh, his disciple, their disciple. The word disciple means a, a, a student and it's applied to all those persons who were going to learn everything the rabbi knew. In the end, a disciple was not only going to learn and know the same as his teacher, but he was also the person who, were, who was going to preserve and transmit his ideas to the next generation. Right? When you were the student of a rabbi, it meant that you put, put on his yoke. See? Es así se dice? His yoke? You put his yoke. Let's say Patsy is a rabbi. And I said, well, I'm looking for some uh, place where I can attend like here in San Antonio. And I already looked to pastor or whatever and to that pastor, a rabbi that I don't like. I like Rabbi Patsy. So I come to her. I do uh, a request. Can, I, can you take me as your student? Can I learn from you? Can I preserve your ideas? Can, I, can, can you uh, uh, check if I am a good person, if I, if I, can, if I can be your, your disciple? Because I why I do that? Because I don't like the other, the other interpretations that the other people have about the Bible. And it's like that in Christianity, right? Everyone has a different interpretation, has a different point of view about the Bible. But I choose Patsy because I like the way she thinks. She is more, uh, she's not a judge judgmental person. She's very merciful with people. She, she's, uh, she likes jokes. <laughs> she likes my jokes. So I like Patsy. I, I have to do a request for her to be his disciple. That's what they were doing in the, in the times of Jesus. We don't know. There's, there's evidence that Jesus went to certain school. He learned from certain school. People in Israel, they think that he was learning from the Pharise Pharisees because he criticized them because he knew them very well. He, there's evidence in the Bible that he was going through a synagogue he was participating in the life of synagogue. He was learning. And in the Bible says that uh, Jesus learned to obey. People sometimes think that Jesus, he was God and he didn't have the, the need to learn. He was God, he knew everything. And he, no, no, there is a principle in leadership. If you want to teach someone, if you want to help somebody for certain problem that you have that, that he has in his, in his life, you need to understand that problem in order to help him. That's why Jesus can help us, because he, he learned to learn. He learned many things in life. One day, a, a friend of mine came to me, and he was a gay. <laughs> he told me. Listen I, need, listen, I need your help. 
And I say, what happened? Uh, I have this problem. He told me the problem. And I said, listen, I cannot help you. Why? Because I have not, I, I don't have that problem. I don't know what is the process that you have to, that you need to have so in order that you go out of your problem. I recommend you to look for people who has the same problem so he can help you, he can tell you what is the process and you could, can go out of that problem. That's why Jesus is able to help you and me because he knows he went through a lot of problems in his life and not only problems but he did a lot of things that he knows how life works in other world sometimes young people that they don't want they don't want to study that they want to do uh, they don't want to go to have school or whatever i told them learn from jesus he learned his mission in life was not to be an engineer. His mission in life was not to be a, a doctor. His mission in life was to save the world. And he, he prepared himself on how to do it. That's why he did it. So what is your mission in life? You're not going to save the world. World, world, world. You're not going to save the world. That's already done. <laughs> Jesus did it, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but you, uh, probably your mission in life is, is you're going to be a, a good engineer, you're going to be a, something, but you have to prepare yourself. That, that is what Jesus did, uh, and that was what people of, at that time were doing. They were looking for a rabbi to learn and uh, they, so, when they went to the third level, they did the application and the, and the, the rabbi always, uh, always um, uh, they, they, they had two answers. Either the rabbi said yes to, to you or no to you. If you went to a rabbi and say, I want to be your disciple, the rabbi investigated you and asked you questions about the Torah, the law, the prophets, verbal traditions. The rabbi wanted to know, is this student able to sit at my feet and learn? Can this person preserve my ideas? Can this person bear my yoke? Does this person have the guts to preserve my legacy? Either you can be approved or disapproved. If you were disapproved, probably the rabbi will tell you something like, you know, you're good, but you're not the best of the best of the best. You don't have what it takes to be my disciple. Go ahead and learn your family business. Do another thing. Go and sell tacos. <laughs> yeah, I have many people sometimes coming to me and said, listen, I want to be the next Marcus Witt, <laughs> the next Hillsong, the next uh, Bethel, the next, I don't know what. And, and, and they start to sing. And I go like, man, not even your mom wants you to sing. <laughs> They don't have what it requires to be the next Marcus with. I mean, they don't have any talent at all. And I said, listen, I think if you sell tacos, it's going to be a best option for you, a better option for you. You're, you're probably going to make more money than singing. <laughs> And that's why rabbis said to people who applied to them, right? Listen, you have what it takes to be uh, 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 the next uh, rabbi, the next rabbi. So go ahead and learn your family business. Do a different thing. But if you were approved, if they saw talent on you, the rabbi probably would thought to himself, I believe this person has everything that I require to preserve my interpretation of the scriptures, my biblical doctrine, my ideas. 
Because for, for a rabbi, it's very important that someone needs to preserve the legacy that they have, that they are building. Somebody needs to preserve the legacy that you are building. Then the rabbi will tell you a very well-known phrase at that time. You know what he will tell you when, he, when you were approved? He will tell you, come and follow me. I always wonder why Jesus said to Peter, John, Matthew, and the others, come and follow me, and they left immediately what they were doing. Now I know that this is a very familiar cultural background. They were very familiar with the term, come I follow, and follow me. They knew what it meant, come and follow me. Someone was giving them the chance of a lifetime. The chance of your a lifetime. It's like if, uh, what is the name of the guy, the, rich, the richest guy on earth? Uh, this. Uh, the, the, the car guy. No, Elon Musk. If, if he will say, hey, come and work for me. If he, if he will find you on the street and he will say, hey, come and follow me. You know he's Elon Musk. You will not say no to him. You will go with him immediately. Probably you will go back if he says, you're going to Mars. <laughs> you know that one time I saw an advertisement some years ago that they were looking for people to go to Mars, and I sent my application. <laughs> And they, and they sent me back an email and they said, we need genius. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> they explained to me. <laughs> and I said, well, at least, at least I'll try. <laughs> they said, I still receive those emails. They're planning to send people to Mars. I don't know when, but... <laughs> But if Elon Musk comes to you and says, hey, come, come work for me, you know that is, that is a chance of a lifetime. That, that, that is what happened with these people. They, they heard the words, come and follow me, and they followed the rabbi. And the family did like a big uh, party for you because you were, you were now supposed to live with your rabbi. You were supposed to follow your rabbi. As you see, in, that happened with Jesus. Once Jesus called them, they left with him. Three years, they were following him. So there was a saying, an old saying, that says people, when they were leaving, they did the, the, la fiesta para ti the party to you, so they dismiss you to, so you can go with your rabbi. They said to you, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. That old saying, it's like the rabbi was walking all those roads, old roads, and he was throwing dust, uh, and the, the disciples were be behind him, and they were covered with the dust. So that means that they, uh, they were covered with the teachings of the rabbi. As they were walking all those roads in life, they were covered with the teachings of the rabbi. So how, for how long they were doing this? From 50 to 30 years. I'm asking you a question. When Jesus started his ministry, with what age was Jesus? He was 30. Interesting. Because that, that means that probably at 30, he graduated from some kind of a school. When he was going to be baptized, John said, no, 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 no. Let's not do this because you, you have to baptize me. And he said, no, 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 no. It needs to be done. Right? So there are many things that Jesus did in his culture just to show leadership. Leadership always does first. Just to show you the way. So 
<clears throat> so they, 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 sometimes we have bad information about uh, how Jesus started his, his ministry, what happened to him regarding Jesus. Uh, he was, and, and regarding the apostles, we think that they, are, they were very old. Jesus began, Luke says that Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Yeah, and Luke 4, 16 says that he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue as was his custom and he read all the time. Uh, <coughs> at 12 he was with the Jewish education system, at 30 he graduated. Uh, he even said, search the scripture because there is eternal life in the scripture. God was not going to send an ignorant Messiah to save the world. Yeah? So, that's why I always say, young people, you have dreams? Go and prepare yourself. Because those dreams that you have, you need to prepare yourself for those dreams. So, we have the story going on that Jesus was walking on the beach and he found uh, uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, etc., etc. And he called them and they left everything. The Bible says that they were already in the family business. So that meant that probably they didn't make it to the third level. They are not following following another rabbi. They were not disciples of anyone. They are already working in the family business. That means that they are not the best of the best of the best. That means that they belong to the group that did not make it to the next level. How old were they? These people probably were around 18, 20, 22. They were really young. I don't understand how, in our culture, we choose all leaders. <laughs> God chooses young people because young people have the potential to do something. You have time. That's the, the time when you have something that we, the old people, don't have anymore. We don't have time. But you guys, young guys, have time ahead of you. I don't understand. When I see... In, our, in politics, they, they choose all people. They're almost dying. And they, this is the next president of this nation. And I go like, dude, you're dying. Let's choose a different one. At least the other one was a clown. At least the other one, <laughs> we have a show every, <laughs> every other week in the White House. <laughs> At least we have representation. <laughs> but this guy... I mean, I said, why we as a culture choose all these old people? In Mexico, it's the same. That old guy. And he's talking every morning. He talks like three words per hour. <laughs> um, um, um. Man, six years, he's going to go like that. God is not going to, well, yeah, I know his chooses at, at, at any age, but it's, it's better when you dedicate your life when you are young because you have that energy. You have that potential. Yeah? And, and I remember when I was uh, really young, I, I used to go to that Catholic church, and uh, I was the one who helped the, the, the priest, and I remember that I always thought to myself, man, heaven is a boring place. With these old guys here, they had all these uh, uh, statues of uh, the apostles, Peter, John, everyone was there. <laughs> they were bold, old. And I remember they had this uh, dress, like long dress. And, and I was very curious. And I was always went look down the dress. 
went back to my house and I asked my mom, Mom, in heaven there is no sex? Why you say that? Because those guys... <laughs> you! How you dare? <laughs> my mom was always... <laughs> I say, well, it's, it's just that it's boring. They are old, they don't have hair, and they don't have, they don't have, I mean, what is heaven? <laughs> it was a bad, I mean, I didn't want to go to heaven and spend my life with those guys. So we have a bad image, right, of heaven. The, the culture, our culture and religion have not painted a real picture for us. So, the, the, the thing that amazed me about this story, about this background, is that when you like it, a rabbi, you go to the rabbi and you ask for a, a request. Can I, can I be your disciple? But the story of Jesus, what amazed me about the story is that no one came to him. He went to them. You know that in other religions, you have to do something for your God. In Muslims, you have to kill the infidels. In order to go to heaven, they can give you the, your 12 virgins. What Muslims, they don't know is that they are going to give them the 12 mother-in-laws. <laughs> then, uh, Hindus, you go to India, I went to India one time, and they, the, cow, the cows, see, say, say cows? They are in the middle of the street. And if, you, if you're in a taxi, the taxi stops. Why? Because it could be my mother that she's in the, in the cow. She reincarnated in the cow. I can, I can kill, kill her. But why do you believe that? But because the relig our religion teaches that. Even a co cockroach. Uh, uh, every, every animal could be your cousin, your uh, dad. Whatever, I said, listen, guys, this is just a call. This is, uh, this is insane to think that, that a cockroach is your, well, it could be your mother-in-law. Right, that's right. Not <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a problem with that one, right? <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> but in Christianity, it's different. You don't have to do anything. God comes to you and looks for you. Do you know why? Because he thinks you are the best of the best of the best. He looks at you like the best of the best of the best. Some people think they are, oh, I don't, I'm not anybody. Probably that's what you see with your own eyes about you. That's your opinion. But God doesn't see you like that. He thinks you are the best of the best of the best. That's why he is calling you. He is calling you and, and he believes in you. That's what the story amazed me. The story of Jesus. How he... When I was young, I thought there was a point in my life that I, I, I said, man, this is, this is boring. I, I did a lot of bad things and I realize none of those things that were... The first time that you smoke or do drugs, it's very exciting, right? You laugh, like... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever drug or anything that you take. But after a while, it becomes that kind of emptiness to you. And now you have a problem because your body is, is used to drugs. And you don't want to do that again. And it becomes like a cycle that is killing you. 
and it is, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> After a while, it's not fun anymore. And I was thinking, what, what is life? Why am I doing here? I don't have any value. I, I don't want to do this or that. Then I heard the story of Jesus. And I thought to myself, if a God can send his son to die for me, is that because I have a value in myself. Someone else is believing in me. Someone else is, give, is, is looking at the value that I have. And some, some God in heaven look at you, and it doesn't matter how do you value yourself. He knows you are the best of the best of the best. That's, that's why he sent his only son to die for you, to put value on you. And it amazed me that when Peter, Peter went, uh, uh, he, he said, command me to go and walk with you. And he started to walk, right? <laughs> and suddenly, ¿cómo se dice se hundió? He sank. He sank. That's a word that I need to learn. He sank. Okay. <laughs> he sank. He went down the water. And most of the time in Christianity, when we do like, uh, when we ask God to do something and suddenly those things are not expected to end up like the way we expected to go, uh, we, we sank, we go down. Uh, what amazed me of this story is that God is always there for you. I have a daughter, and my daughter, is, she's called, she's, her name is Daniela, and, and Daniela sometimes calls me, and she says, oh, you don't understand what it is to be depressed. She, sometimes he goes through some problems. He lives in L.A. by herself. I said, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is very expensive in L.A. So she's always an anxiety. She, she's building his career, but you know how hard it is to live in L.A. I uh, said to my wife that I heard uh, a famous artist the other day, a lady. She said, I'm going to go out of L.A. I can't stand living here anymore. I said, if she says that about L.A., can you imagine Daniela, who is not, not a successful person yet, uh, she, doesn't have, she doesn't have a lot of money. But she, Daniela comes, some, sometimes calls me and she said, I'm an anxiety and depressive person. I'm in depression. You don't know how it feels to be depressive and blah, 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 blah. You know how kids are. You don't understand life. I don't understand life because you are depressed. I have been through depression many times. I remember when I lo one time that I lost my job, I... I woke up every morning and I said, I want to kill myself. <laughs> what? How does it feel to be dead? But then I remember that there, there, there was hell and I said, no, better not. <laughs> so I had all this depressive, depressive thinking and Daniela asked me, I, I said, Daniela, I went to depression, I'm a happy person. Yeah, but how do you do it? It's very simple. How? How do you do it? Well, I, tell, I told her about what I did every morning. I realized I had this, all these depressive uh, thoughts in, my, in me, and I said, I cannot continue to, to go like that because I was complaining. Oh, I don't have work. I don't have anything to eat. So one day I went to the freezer and I was complaining about that I had, I had not anything to eat. I opened the freezer and it was full of food. But when you are depressed, when you are in a bad, in a, when you have the bad perspective about your life, you complain about anything. It doesn't matter if you have everything. And I said to Daniela, Daniela, it's, this is a matter of stepping in a different perspective. Every day, you have to learn to be happy. Every day, you have to learn 
to leave, leave behind all those bad thoughts. Every day, you have to learn to put back everything that bad that happened to your life, that my friends did this to me. Don't, don't, don't care about your friends. They're, they are like you. We are all the same, so don't worry about them. And I said, this is the, you have to woke up every morning. And what I learned is that if I woke up with those thoughts, I have to look at this story. I went down the water, and I, like Peter, I have to look back at the boat. What I'm going to see if I look back at the boat? I'm going to see Jesus' hands telling me, hey, you sank, but I'm here to help you. I'm here to put you in a different perspective because I believe you are the best of the best of the best and I believe you still have a lot of potential and I believe you, you still have a good uh, uh, road to go and cover. So give me your hand and I will help you. And he gave Peter his hand and he put him back on the boat. Every day you need to grab Jesus' hands and he's going to put you back on the boat. Right. He's going to put you in a different perspective in your life. Amen. Amen. We all suffer many things. Yes. Life is not easy. It's never going to be easy. But if we change our perspective, if we step with Jesus in the boat with him, the perspective is going to change. You're going to see your own potential. You're going to see what God is going to do for you. I can tell you a lot of stories, but my time is finished. I don't go usually uh, more than 45 minutes, but like I've been translating for, to myself. <laughs> uh, I, I lost my parents on the, on the pandemic, both of them. And uh, I never experienced something like that, but uh, what I... I, I used to do every day. They live in Mexico, and I used to call them by iPhone. Every day when I came out of work, I put my iPhone, and I, I check on my parents. I always call my sister, and I said, uh, put my mom on and my dad. So they were there, and I was talking to them. Hey, how are you guys? Blah, 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 blah. Every day for years and years. And I, we went to visit them uh, to Mexico. We live in Torreón, which is close to Monterrey. So suddenly, I lost them. And I started to feel that emptiness. And I said, I need to go back to the boat with Jesus. Yes. And see a different perspective. Yes. So I called my sister and I said, put my mom on. <laughs> my mom is not there, but the box with the, you know, with the, the ashes is there, and she put my mom on. Hey, mother, how are you? <laughs> I know you are in a better place. I know you are great. I know you are with your Savior right now. I put in the boat with Jesus, and I look at the perspective, the right perspective, and I'm happy. Amen. We all go through different things, negative things in life. With If we... Take Jesus' hand and put ourselves in, in the boat with him. We're going to change our thinking. And that's with what we need to do. We need to be happy. If, if, one of the apostles says, be happy with everything that happens to you because it's a test. And a test always brings you to a better place. So... When you look at the Bible through that perspective, and the reason, the reason why Peter asked <coughs> Jesus to come and walk in water is because he knew, if he calls me, is because rabbis, students, they were doing, they were talking as the, rab as the teacher, and not only talking, but, but doing as his teacher. And Jesus was a different rabbi. He was a, not a normal rabbi. He was healing people. 
He was uh, saying things that nobody said before. He was raising people from the dead. He was walking on water. He said, okay, if he choose me and he's doing this, then me, I can make it too. How many great things God calls you to do? Impossible things sometimes. And, well, that's the background of the story. And it's it's incredible story because uh, it's incredible to know that God chose me because I'm the best of the best of the best. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Oh, dear God, we give you thanks to you because you're, you're thinking about us, that we are the best of the best of the best. That's why you, you call us, you choose us to have a wonderful life, to experience this wonderful spiritual life in you. We're going to give you thanks, God. We praise you. We love you. We hope uh, the best is still to come every day, every new day. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to show me a better way in life. In the middle of anxiety, depression, and all the problems that we could have out of that ship. Thank you for extending your hand and bringing me back to your ship, dear Lord. Thank you very much. We praise you and we love you.